My name is Alan Gillette. I'm the Fish Passage Program Coordinator for the Oregon Department of Transportation. Culvert Repair Programmatic Agreement that we have is an agreement between the Oregon Department of Transportation and the Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife. It's proven to be a very valuable agreement, uh, I think both for Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife and ODOT. Um, as you can see, we're getting a lot of great restoration projects in the ground at high priority passage barriers. What the agreement also allows us to do is, um, as the Oregon Department of Transportation, is make repairs um, on some of our poor and critical condition culverts throughout the state. My name is uh, Peter Bakey. I work with uh, ODFW as the uh, ODFW ODOT Fish Passage Liaison. So as uh, part of the Culvert Repair Programmatic Agreement, ODOT provides $2 million up front and we get an additional $50,000 for every project over 40 projects. And this helps offset the delay until full passage is presided at these uh, repair sites. And so what we're trying to do with the money is um, get to these high priority projects. Uh, we really try to target projects on our 2019 fish passage priority list. And so we contribute funds to people that are more or less shovel ready to help them get these projects like this completed. So this project uh, uh, was definitely the biggest project I've done in my time and I think one of the bigger projects the Watershed Council's taken on. It's one of the biggest open bottom culverts they actually make. Um, so there's all kinds of logistical issues which is part of the reason it you know wasn't done when you know we knew in 1960 it was a fish passage issue and kind of all those band-aid um, efforts in the past didn't really amount to much because it didn't tackle the actual problem which was the, the culvert itself so the amount of fill over the culvert was a big challenge it was over over 7,000 cubic yards of material over the culvert itself um, finding a spot for that was a was was a challenge the the position of the culvert on the on the hairpin turn was also a challenge and that was a big part of the design working with the Forest Service was could it be a bridge could it be an open bottom culvert um, and that hairpin turn made a bridge a lot more expensive um, so that's where we ended up through the design process with the open bottom culvert which essentially is a bridge when you when, you, when it's all said and done um, but just getting um, all the materials out to the site, that was a big challenge. We're 14 miles out of Forest Service roads. Um, the coast, as it, on its own, is, presents its challenges. We say pretty good for the coast, usually, and um, you add that with the remote location and all those things, it really made for some challenges. I'm Christopher Clare with the Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife. I work out at Coos Bay as a habitat protection biologist. I work on a lot of restoration projects with technical design and expertise for watershed councils and other agencies. Uh, Baker Creek here is really all about anadromous fish, fish that couldn't get through this section of stream with the 12 foot culvert that was perched 15 feet. That uh, culvert had been in since 1951 and was put in to uh, allow for a road to be built where a train trestle had previously allowed for the train tracks to be, to be across. And then uh, they built the, uh, put the fill over the new pipe and it had, the pipe had to be put in where there was a slot through the train trestle. And then they rebuilt the tracks on that fill. It wasn't actually a road, but a, but a train track. Uh, a ladder was put in, a steep pass Deneal Fishway in, in the early 1990s and it allowed for some steelhead passage, but coho struggled, and steelhead still struggled to some degree, and we are pretty confident that coastal cutthroat trout did not make it over the ladder to any significant degree. So uh, it's been a long time coming to get Baker Creek removed. There's 2.8 miles of good spawning and rearing habitat for coho, steelhead, fall chinook, Pacific lamprey, which of course is a species that's culturally important to both tribal folks and uh, uh, the rest of us. And so it's been a fantastic project. This last summer we removed, you know, 15, 16,000 cubic yards of soil and there was quite a bit of permitting that had to be worked into that mix. I'm Sasha Strain. Uh, I'm with Warehouser. And this is the Baker Creek project that we collaborated with multiple partnerships and agencies on. It's sustainable. It's um, a good move going forward because it really helps the habitat for our wildlife that we also like to manage as well as our trees. 
and then it also um, improves our relationships with the communities. There was a lot of effort that we had to take to make sure that we kept all our neighbors happy when, you know, we have equipment running in and out every day. And it was just, it was good working together with all the people on this and really truly seeing how a community can come together to make such an effort. We've already seen Coho up here this year and in this subsequent years we didn't do uh, extensive surveys this year but in subsequent years we will and so we would consider the project a success already for anadromous fish including coho false chinook winter steelhead and coastal cutthroat anadromous cutthroat and pacific lamprey it, it's really a great project to help provide thermal refugia for juvenile salmonids to come out of the main stem South Fork Coquille. The main stem South Fork gets in the low to mid 70s in the summer. Fish struggle with those temperatures and they need some place to go where it's cooler and Baker Creek is only one of three main tributaries below powers that have the potential for fish to find a place to be happy with cooler water. We are looking at the East Fork Millicoma Oxbow Reconnection Project that we did with Weyerhaeuser in 2016. Um, so we, this channel behind me used to be dry essentially and the channel was diverted out of its main course um, back in the 50s. And so this project reconnected the original habitat, the original river course um, to get the system back functioning the way it should be. The Oxbow project here, uh, you might notice behind me, you see the bridge uh, pillar there, but just to the left of that, the old river used to come right along through where you see that large earthen bank there. And now it runs right in front of me here on up to the, to the east around what we would call the Oxbow. And it's a typical Oxbow where it's kind of in a U shape. In 1958, the uh, old wooden bridges that are where these concrete bridges were were failing and so Weyerhaeuser uh, cut a slot through the hill to try and manage costs and the river ended up getting put in that s section and so what used to be six tenths of a mile of stream distance to go up 20 feet through the oxbow uh, became 20 feet a drop in five to seven hundred feet and so there was a bedrock sheet underneath that and the water became very shallow at various flows and very swift and uh, fall chinook suffered the most the data showed with odfw that up to 90 percent of fall chinook didn't make it above that point odfw surveys uh, documented that coho are the uh, next stronger swimmer out of chinook coho and steelhead and they suffered as well they the passage wasn't terrible but they were delayed severely and then would only get up there later in the run when fish were mature and we feel like the distribution of fish above this point uh, was poor and, and the majority of the habitat for coho in the Millicoma system, the East Fork Millicoma is above this point. So severe issues there for coho production. Steelhead were a stronger swimmer, but still were delayed. It's a huge feat for working with a private timber company and a watershed council and state and federal agencies all coming together to write something that didn't go according to plan. Um, I think that is so impressive, um, just that peer collaboration. And then this was kind of one of my really big projects right when I first started working here. I got the designs and everything handed to me and I just kind of took it and ran with it and really glad that it turned out the way it did because it's so impressive and it just makes me smile every time I drive by it. So it makes me happy. A lot of the highway infrastructure was put in from the 40s through the 60s. Fish passage at the time wasn't really at the top of the, at the, top of the priority list during some of our um, the building of some of that infrastructure. Um, obviously, since then, we've learned a lot about fish passage needs, migratory fish um, requirements for getting through certain, particularly road crossings. Um, I think we found during the mid-90s with the passage of the fish laws that uh, we have a bad problem with fish passage for native migratory fish in the state of Oregon. We have a lot of barriers on um, ODOT and other highway systems across um, road systems, forest service systems. 
Um, so I think we're doing everything we can to rectify the passage in, in addition to some of the habitat. So our culvert inventory has kind of shown us that we have 35,000 culverts or so that we own or operate. Out of that 35,000 culvert number, we have about a third of them that are in poor critical condition. Um, given declining maintenance funds and some of the challenges with providing full fish passage at every one of those sites, the agreement allows us to make repairs, um, fixes at some of those culvert crossings, improve fish passage at those sites, and then in turn we have the compensation fund that gets at high priority barriers off of the ODOT system.